Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hi, guys. Let's learn, shall we? Uh, the Spitfire. How it keeps getting better. Preemptive-like. Iconic warplane. Um, I am fast. I am equally clueless and fascinated by this sort of stuff, so you guys really help in the comments. I appreciate anyone with any sort of expertise or can call me out if I say something wrong, which happens quite a bit, but that's part of the process. Did I say the original link to the video, top description, Discord, below that? Would love to have you. Let's go. We are now standing next to one of the most iconic aeroplanes probably of all time. It looks We're so standing next cool to too. a Mark I Spitfire. A very clever designer that some of you may have heard of, a gentleman called Reginald Mitchell. This was his design that he came out with. Initially, ideas were going to call it the Shrew. But a lot of good. pub argument later, the name became synonymous with this aeroplane, the Spitfire. Spitfires did not stay like this. Between 1937 and 1947, Spitfires came out in their thousands, over 20,000 of them. Obviously, war is a terrible thing, but one thing it does bring is lightning quick development between the combatants involved. In the seven years of Spitfires that were actually in production, they changed quite dramatically from the Mark I to the Mark 24, which we have here in airspace, which we'll see later. This is Britain's best-known fighter aircraft, the Spitfire. We Americans in Britain know the Spitfire. We've seen it in action. Many of us have flown it in action. Believe me, the Spitfire has got what it takes. During the Battle of Britain, a mere handful of hurricanes and Spitfires worked with Britain's anti-aircraft command. And between them, they knocked all hell out of the Nazis. Obviously, Mitchell being a designer of racing aeroplanes, the unique and fantastic thing about a Spitfire is its wing. Taking three times as many man-hours to build the Spitfire wing as it took Messerschmitt to build the mass-produced 109 wing. Spitfire's beautiful elliptical wing is very thin. If you press the side of it, it's like the back of a fork. But a disadvantage is you have to splay the guns out quite a lot. The cannons initially that were put into Spitfires were not popular because of the wing. They had to tilt the cannons on the side and if the pilot pulled any high G quite a lot. The cannons initially that were put into Spitfires were not popular because of the wing. They had to tilt the cannons on the side and if the pilot pulled any high G maneuvers as a fighter pilot would when he's trying to fight for his life, the guns would jam. Another feature of a Mark I Spitfire, the ailerons, very basic. Irish linen to be precise and doped and molded to a streamlined shape as also is the elevator and rudders. We've come round to the nose of N3200 now. A few things that you might be able to see that are slightly different. One white wing underneath, one black wing underneath for recognition. So British gunners wouldn't blast it out the sky if they saw something with a black and white wing. Unfortunately, then the Germans are going to know as well. Exactly. Then so they would we can that idea quite quick. Also here, we've got the very, very beautiful and famous Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. In initial design, about 990 horsepower, but in fighter trim, 1100 plus, depending on how good... It's, th it's things like that where I really wish I, I knew how to put that, that horsepower number into perspective. Um, uh, obviously, it's a lot, but I, I, I just I don't have the knowledge of horsepower enough to to know how, how amazing that is. But in fighter trim, 1100 plus. Depending on how good the engineers and the servicing were at each squadron, you could get in a Mark I up to 1300 horsepower if you got quite a trick mechanic. Reginald Mitchell, as brilliant as the engineer was, was really not a very well man indeed, and unfortunately died at the time he was 42. Mitchell only actually ever saw K5054, his prototype Spitfire fly. After that, all the development was taken over by a very clever gentleman called Joe Smith that oversaw all the development from the Mark I to the F-24 Spitfire, which we'll see later. In the design of the Spitfire, which is a real beautiful thing to fly, 
The first Spitfire I flew, Dunkirk, was I think a thousand horsepower, maybe a thousand two. And the final one was in the same airframe was two thousand four hundred horsepower with a two speed. So, so does that mean it can go two point four times faster? Like it, 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 if something has five hundred horsepower, if if a plane has if you have a Spitfire that has 500 horsepower and a Spitfire that has 1,000 horsepower, it, is that going to equal double the speed? Uh, I, it's really hard for me to... A horsepower a, a, as a measurement is really... ...to change supercharge. It was the best airplane. It, it, the Germans admitted it in the end. And it, it, and it wasn't a new airplane. It was just the same airframe designed by R.J. Mitchell, who is the great, great designer of the Spitfire. As we've said earlier, we're going to be looking at the development of the Spitfire. Now Spitfire started at 1 and ended in 24, but there were lots of different submarks. Now not all those Spitfires were put into production. For instance, the Mark 1s and Spitfires of the Battle of Britain didn't go straight onto 3s and 4s. The next full production Spitfire was a Mark 5. We're going to head over to another of Duxford's historical hangars now, Hangar 3, to check out the Mark 5 Spitfire BM597. The exhaust pipes on the side look so freaking cool. It's like a muscle car. And we're over now with a Mark V Spitfire. So we've moved on now to 1941 and to 42. A few upgrades from the Mark I and the Mark II, a more powerful engine between 1300 and 1400 horsepower. Ailerons now, metal, but still with a fabric, rudder and elevator. Now we have a fair bit more power, but unfortunately in 1941, a gentleman called Kurt Tank in Germany had invented the Focke-Wulf 190. And a Focke-Wulf 190 could outclass a Mark V Spitfire in most respects, except a high-speed dive from a very high altitude. So to help the Mark V Spitfire roll out of the way quicker, the beautiful elliptical wing on the end of a Spitfire was clipped off, or rather ceased to be put on from here, from this stream of rivets here. Not as pretty as the original elliptical wing, but of course, in wartime it hardly matters. But aiding the Mark V to roll out of the way a lot quicker. So by elliptical wing, does he mean in, instead of a more gradual point, they just kind of like nip it there? ...than it initially could. It couldn't turn as tight because the surface area is not there, but rolling, it was a massive advantage to help the Mark V Spitfire. That's how the present Spitfire V was evolved. She's essentially the same as Spitfires 1 and 2, but for the squared off wing tips. And most versions will be seen with cannon mounted on the wing. The M597 has also been a bit of a TV star for those of you that remember the series Foil's War. In the story, Foil's son is portrayed as a Spitfire pilot, and BM597 here starred in quite a few of the scenes. So, with engineers trying to wring every square ounce of power out of the Mark V engine and clipping the ends off the wings, the Mark V Spitfires obviously needed to be replaced. So, we'll have a look at what replaced them. Okay, so here we are now by the Mark 9 Spitfire. We're about 1943 now. This aeroplane, MH434, started life on the production line at Castle Bromwich as a Mark V probably. The tail fin is just exactly the same as a Mark V. But by the time it got to the end of the line, she was a 9. Rolls-Royce had come up with the two-speed, two-stage and intercooled supercharged engine and a four-bladed constant speed propeller. Two huge radiators underneath to sort the cool. Is that so they could shoot in between the pulling out and with between one? I gotta shut up. Propeller. Two huge radiators underneath to sort the cooling out and with between 1,650 and 1,700 horsepower, a Mark 9 Spitfire could redress the balance against a Fort Wolf 190. But then when you get that kind of performance again, it's down to who saw who first, who's luckiest, or who can get the best out of their fighter aeroplane. A lot of the, the, the reason I, I, I'm, I, I'm so confused with horsepower as, as something is like, well, if you want to imagine, well, say like, I'm like, well, isn't how much is a thousand horsepower, right? And if someone said, well, think about it, like a Formula One car has like a 500 horsepower. I, I don't know if that's true, but say someone says that as an example, but 
there are so many different factors that go into how a plane moves than how a car moves. I, 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 I don't want to take up too much time. I... Fighter pilots in the wartime had the Mark 9 down as their favorite mount of Spitfire. Air Vice Marshal Johnny Johnson, the high scoring Spitfire ace to survive the war. Rumor has it that he chased a Focke-Wulf 190 through the rigging of a ship with his Mark 9 Spitfire. When you see the 9 in action, you'll notice all the familiar Spitfire features. The wing shape, the curved underside and small fin and rudder. And don't forget the new features the longer nose with the pigeon breast beginning to disappear, and the two symmetrical radiators. That's the Mark 9. Pigeon breast? This particular Mark 9, as I mentioned, is MH434, huh? arguably the most valuable and most famous Spitfire in the world. There are about 52 airworthy Spitfires now, depending on uh, serviceability at the time, and MH434 other than an overall, has been airworthy since 1943. 434 is also a bit of a film star. She has been in just about every movie featuring a Spitfire since the wartime. Operation Crossbow with George Peppard, Sophie Loren, the Battle of Britain, of course, painted up as a Mark I and a Mark II. And lastly, that I know of, a movie called The Lang Girls, where she was expertly flown by Mark Hanna. Mark Hanna was a son of squadron leader Ray Hanna of Red Arrow's fame and Ray and Mark expertly flew this aeroplane in air shows all over. But MH434, still beautiful and still famous and still here in Hangar 3 at Duxford for you to come and see. And I flew the Mark I, which we had in 1940 in the battle, the Mark II, the V, the IX and the XXI. My favorite actually was the nine because that had a longer nose and had a more powerful air engine they did the same with the 21 but the 21 was um it was reminded me rather of trying to put a four liter engine in a, a morris a mini car or something it was nose heavy we very good in a straight line but any maneuverability had gone but i never flew them on ops in fact they hardly ever were used because it was right at the end of the war but the spit nine was the i would say the finest so here we are in Hangar 2 now at Duxford, and behind me, the Mark 14 Spitfire. Does that have an extra blade? You may notice... And it blows my mind how, like, where's the, like, that this propeller propels the plane. Like, this provides the forward thrust, is the propeller itself. And that is just crazy to me. Quite a bit different. Behind me, the Mark 14 Spitfire you may notice quite a bit different to the previous Merlin engine Spitfires that we've been looking at. It's because it's powered by the Rolls-Royce Griffin. The Rolls-Royce Merlin up to the Mark 9 and the Mark 16 and the Mark 8 Spitfire have been tuned to about as far as it could go with 1,700 horsepower. A little bit more towards the end of the war, right at the end with the Hornet, but Rolls-Royce had developed the 36.9 litre V12 Griffin, nearly 10 litres bigger, over 2,000 horsepower, a five-bladed propeller to power it, initially in the Mark 12 Spitfire, but mainly into squadron service as a Mark 14. Now, this aeroplane now equaled just about anything with a propeller at the front that the Germans could put in the sky. The counterpart from Germany at the time was the D-model Focke-Wulf 190. Wasn't the he first had two jet powered? there going through the air at nearly 450 miles an hour. Really, I don't care how powerful your piston engine is, with a huge 12 or 13 foot fan at the front of your aeroplane, you're not gonna go through the air much quicker than that. Okay, we're now gonna go over to airspace to see our final Spitfire. Many Spitfires were equipped for special tasks. Some for photo reconnaissance work. Some for bombing on special mission. And in 1944, Spitfire pilots had an assignment after their own hearts. Hundreds of flying bombs fell to the cannon of Spitfire interceptors. All this time, the Royal Navy's carrier-based Spitfires, what? known as Sea Fires, were hitting the enemy from the sea. And these Sea Fires are playing a leading role in the drama of world events today. Here we are then. We've come a long way from the Mark 1 Spitfire now. 
as far as I'm aware, the only Allied frontline fighter in complete and continuous development all the way through the war, from Mitchell's initial design in 1938 to the last of the Spitfires in 1947. In this time, Jets. of course, the jet was in its infancy and piston-engined aeroplanes were entering the twilight of their career. But, as we'll see in a second, a piston-engined aeroplane of this magnitude behind me still had quite a few tricks up its sleeves. I was just about to say, could, why not have both? Why not have the jet engines and the propeller in case the, the jet engines fail, then you can use the propeller. But then I realized you'd have to add a whole other giant engine that you're only going to need to use in, in emergency scenarios. So, no. But um, I wonder if... Obviously, if, if the pilot was KIA, then it's likely that his airplane was also lost. Uh, but I, I wonder how much, like, they, they, uh, how a certain pilot, did he always fly the same plane? Not just for familiarity, obviously they're all manufactured the same way, but maybe there's a certain little things in the cockpit or something that make you a little more comfortable and used to and could affect your flying and your mindset. But also just like, a, a, to, I wonder if they had a relationship with their airplane, kind of like uh, like Full Metal Jacket, that movie that they had with uh, their rifle. It's like, you will sleep with your rifle. You will talk with your rifle. You have no girlfriend. This is your girl. I just wonder if they had a, like if they ever had to eject or, or something, or if they felt like they lost something more than just a machine. After the war, just because peacetime comes, it doesn't mean to say development stops. With a huge 36.9 litre Griffin engine, nearly 10 litres bigger than the initial Rolls-Royce Merlin, nearly twice the power, nearly twice the weight, the 24, the last mark in 1947. Only 80 of them made. From the nose, we have a huge five-bladed propeller spinning the opposite direction to the Merlin engine. The wings, very different, even looking very elliptical and quite similar. Joe Smith taking on Mitchell's initial design, sleeker, faster and stronger. Huge cannons in the armament, a lower back and towards the end, a huge tail with a huge rudder to counteract the forces of over 2,000 horsepower spinning one way in a five-bladed propeller. The F-24 Spitfire, or a huge rudder and Towards the end, a huge tail with a huge rudder to counteract the forces of over 2,000 horsepower spinning one way in a five-bladed propeller. The F-24 huh? Spitfire or Mark 24, completely different aeroplane to the Mark 1 Spitfire. The Mark 1 Spitfire, beautiful. The Mark 24 Spitfire at the end or the F-24, quite beasty looking, but still iconically sleek and iconic now as it always has been. This aeroplane, VN485, started life in 1947 and was soon swiftly sent over to Hong Kong for the Hong Kong Auxiliary Air Force. VN485 here took her last flight in 1955 for the Queen's flyby birthday parade. Coming to visit Duxford allows people to see from all over the world, Spitfires all the way through production. There are more Spitfires here at Duxford all gathered together in one place than probably anywhere else in the world. From the very early Mark 1s all the way through to the very last Mark 24. Ooh! Today we stood here. Ah, uh, yes, please. Uh, love you guys. Hope you're all doing well. If you could answer any of the questions. Actually, no, 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 wait. Stop, I wanna ask something. Okay, so here's my plane here, right? All right, here's the front of the plane. Here's the wing, the, the other wing goes up there, but I, I don't need it for this demonstration. And then here is the, uh, the back thing, right? So there's the cockpit. So if, if, if we're looking at the plane this direction, all right? So we'll, right there, all right? So we're looking at it. And then these flaps, which are, you know, uh, straight, 
that can be turned up or or down, right? And and so when when they push the thing in the cockpit to make those flaps go up and wind is 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 obviously they're they're going into wind, right? It goes under it and I'm not really sure what force that makes, but the wind that goes over the wing and then hits the flap is going to want to make the flap move this way, right? I meant to do that in uh in red. Move this way, right? And if the that that would make the plane go up, right? Whereas vice versa, right? Um when the flap is down and you have the wind going and then it hits here, well then the the wing is going to want to go upwards, right? Which would make the plane go in a dive, right? And same goes with the flap in the back. Like now we're looking at it this way, right here, and you have that flap go this way, right? I, I, I'm talking about this right here, right? Then the air that goes into it is going to want to push this that way which means it would turn that way and vice versa if if it over there right and for the propeller which is all all amazing for me like you know you know a, a helicopter right uh that's that's my helicopter okay guys that's a helicopter so the spinning of the blade makes uh like if you ever had one of those those toys that you just like feel like that and they fly upward the the thrust is providing the upward motion of the aircraft and so if you just is that the same exact thing that the front that that a propeller driven aircraft does in that here's the propeller and when it's going in or the engine is spinning it that the the same force that picks up the air, the helicopter it's just going this way, and so it's pushing it through the air like that. Because that is awesome. How how much, if that's true, how much force spinning propellers can do? Can uh, or like a, I guess you could say say on, on a on a ship too. I won't go into it. A uh, really cool video. I hope that made sense. I'm a, I know I'm a great artist, and uh, I'll see you guys next time. All right, bye guys.